Give me your opening premise. Play. Give me the the king's gambit. <laughs> Be very afraid, Jared. Melbourne are going at about seventy percent of last year, and they're already proving they're fifty percent better than the rest of the competition. They're four and zero, and they're going half rap power. And, and people say, "Oh, that that's ridiculous." But if you don't look at the winning and the losing and you just look at the numbers, which is what, what we do, we try to look at the trends of the game. So last year they were not just the best team in the comp without the footy, they were best by some margin back to number two. They were the fourth best with the footy and, and they're the two things that I mainly track. And we always know their their contest stuff is unbelievable because of the talent that they've got and the, the, the way, the brutality in which they play with Oliver and Petrarca and Lever being able to win the ball back and... Those guys in the forward half, you know, they just win contests. We talk about the two rucks a lot, but all over the ground they just win contests. If you look at them this year, so so the rankings that I'll just give you last year's rankings just to give you an idea, okay? So the four, the core four mm-hmm. that Horny and I track, they were seven with the footy, one, five, and one without the footy clearance, post clearance. So seven, one, five, one. But the two ones were by a huge margin. This year, right now, they're going twelve, four, twelve, one. <laughs> So they, they, they're they nowhere near – everyone's talking about the finished product of the other teams, the, the chasing pack. The Demons are nowhere near, and a lot of it's to do with talent that's out at the moment. So they're having to move different players to different areas. Brayshaw's having to go back. He's their, he's their winner. Right? Um, and they're getting full-toed odds out of, out of marquee players at marquee moments. So they're putting away teams on, – on, not on talent. It's a bit harsh to say that. Their defensive stuff is still incredibly strong, but – it's not at the levels of last year. It, it really isn't. So I'll, I'll look at them and I say, okay, their defensive 50 is still the best in the comp and their ability to win the ball back is still the best in the comp, intercepts through that mid zone between the arcs. Outside of that, they are a very average football team by their standards and by the competition standards. So the scope for improvement at Melbourne is still greater than the scope for improvement at other clubs. In this season, in this season, given the talent you've got and the system you've got, the system you've started with. Now, we know that things change after six to eight weeks for every team. They all, you know, tinker with the way they're playing, you have their finger on the pulse with the trends of the competition and they make alterations. But right now, they're going at 70% and they're clearly, clearly better than any other team in the competition. So be very afraid, Jared. They felt coming into the season, they felt to me like a 19 3 or a 22 team. And the question is can anybody lift their level to catch them? It's a preliminary final question. But they're Richmond 2018 at the moment. They're going to run the comp and we'll see you in the prelims. Yeah. See what it looks like then. All right. So the big issue, the, the emotional journey through Sunday which I thought was compelling, not having my emotions invested in it. So watching the Essendon struggle, and it was always going to be a struggle. I didn't think there was anything the least bit surprising that that was going to go down to the final seconds, but Essendon got it by any means necessary. They got it. St Kilda, um, just dynamic, powerful 22 goals on the MCG on a Sunday. Mm. It's good going. And then Carlton through the trap door. So one at a time, Essendon first. Well, Essendon's biggest problem is they can they can beat anyone, but they can get beaten by anyone. That they, they, they only engage when they have possession of the footy. And they rely on their key defenders to win the ball back, intercept mark, but with no help. It, it, it's, it's, it's a game of two up when you play them. You know, your turn, our turn, you know, and... They're the poorest in the competition without the footy. That's 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 a model that doesn't bring any success. So they've got a, they've got huge problems, Essendon, to fix that. This is the second preseason now under Rutten, and we haven't seen we haven't seen the the, the defensive stability come to this group yet. So when will it come? And I think there's a level of frustration with the Essendon fans about it now. It's starting to stay in the bubble. Um, I do think the hardest thing to do is to score, to move the ball and score. That, that's, that's the hardest thing to do in footy because everyone is defensively geared. They're, they're all capable and they all know that if you can't do it, you can't have long-term success. So when will Essendon do it is the question. And right now it, it appears a fair way away. Um, so I, I feel for the Essendon backseat. I, I'd, I'd hate to be an Essendon defender because not only do you have to beat your man, you have to, you have to actually win the ball back 
to start the next chain. They never looked comfortable against Adelaide. And Adelaide do some things that really threaten you. And Adelaide, I thought they were going to win that game. I really did. And Tex Walker was a massive inclusion for them. They just every time went forward, they looked like scoring. Um, so in in the end, it was the it was the win they had to have, and you just said, I don't care about it. You know, we, we had this conversation last week. They got to bank one and three, and then they got to go two and three, and they got to square the ledger. But if they can't defend, if they can't stop the opposition at all, which is what we're talking about right now, the yep. worst in the competition. Don't worry about don't worry about the end of the year. It's ain't happening. There's no finals for the Bombers if they can't engage when they don't have the football. St Kilda? Well, the Saints the Saints do a lot right, don't they? I mean, we've, we've been fascinated by the Saints over the last couple of years, and, and, and we're hard on, on St Kilda. We really are. Because every now and then they, they just play a, dip, a, a funny brand of footy where they play a fluky game. Like last year was get forward of the ball, uh, charge and pressure was they, only, they were sporadic with their pressure on the opposition, but you, you have to you have to give them credit for what they're doing this year. And you know they're one of the better teams when, when they win the ball, and they're really difficult when they don't have it now. They're top four in both, and that's the model we're looking at. That that's the growth, and there's a lot goes into that. And it's not about you know I heard the boys talking this morning. They're talking about Brad Hill and 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 talking about the roles that individuals are playing and that guy's playing. It's not really about that. It's more about the, the, the defensive unit of, you know, starting from your forwards who, who have got role players down there putting pressure on. Then it feeds in the midfield. Jack Sinclair, I heard you call her. Kathy. Kathy yeah. earlier this morning. She's spot on, Kathy. It's so good to see Jack Sinclair, who's a bit of a whipping boy in the past. He's the number two ranked midfielder in the comp- – sorry, two rated midfielder in the competition right now. Number two. That just shows how good he's going. Now, you can you can – Argue the numbers and say, oh, I don't like the ratings. If you're number one, two or three in anything, you're going really well. Yep. So, you know, they've, they've had a big win there. Um, I think when you have structure like this, when you have when you have your stars leading the way and your role players playing roles, then everything comes together and everyone gets the opportunity to play to their, to their strengths and, and, and be their best. And you're sort of seeing that. You have your magic makers. Like Gresham kicking kicking goals like he did, Brad Hill's running capabilities, getting forward, kicking goals like he he threatens no matter whether he's a wingman or a half forward. And Jath gave him some luxuries, he gave him some scope, and he he was paid a he made to pay a price. But I think what St Kilda did was say, okay, the Hawks are going to be super aggressive. They're going to want to come through the corridor and they're going to want to springboard from half back and threaten us immediately. So when, you, when, when you're sort of planning for that game, you're thinking, we could have a field day here if we can keep keep the pressure on them and be ready to pick off that ball that they're going to be aggressive with coming back to the ball. So coming through the corridor. So if you look at their intercept work, anywhere outside of their defensive 50, so between the arcs and obviously in your forward 50, but you don't normally get a lot out of your forward 50 stuff. They've scored 14 goals from their forward half work, 11 of that on turnover. And if you add if you add that next layer back, the half back flank area, so the full midfield, on, on intercept work, they've scored they've scored fifteen goals. So, so they saw Hawthorne coming. They saw him coming, and they said that's not a model that that, that we that, that should beat us. So if we're defensively strong, you'll get the offensive rewards. So for me, huge tick for the coaching staff to have them prepped, ready to go, know what's coming, don't get beaten by what you know is yep. what, what I've always said. Um, and if and if you look at the other coaches' box, the fascination for me right now is what does Sam Mitchell do now? So we're going to put that in a category a little later on. All right. So sit on that. So I, I didn't want to sit on that. I was going to go strong. There. Just take me through the third of the emotional <laughs> voyages, which was Carlton at oh, the yeah, end the, of Sunday. Well, I, I felt a bit sorry for Vossi. So you go, you go into the. So they, they're a, they're a clearance team. They they score on clearance. They bash you, as we said last week. So. Again, coming into this game, Carlton, number one in the competition, scores differential from clearance, plus three goals a game. Number one. That's a that's a big asset. So they, they get ambushed at clearance and they get ambushed at punishment from clearance because they had t- – yeah, the imp- impact of wits can't be understated in this game. He just dominated yep. hit outs and, and took away Carlton's game by hitting to advantage. Some of those forward 50 stoppages were just a thing of beauty. So at the end of the day, the Gold Coast <laughs> – 
they, 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 they win the clearances by plus 24 points, by plus four goals. That's a huge starting point. So, you've take, so Carlton's strength of, of plus three goals is now a four-goal deficit. That's a huge swing. So they've got to try and find seven goals somewhere else. doesn't happen. You're talking about one or two goal swings in terms of coaching. Most games are won by two, two and a half goals. So if you can take a goal off your opponent and add a goal somewhere onto your, that's, that's the game. That's the result. So when you get a swing like that, uh, it, it's huge. It's a, it's terrific for these young players. They're not young anymore. We keep calling them young at the Gold Coast. They're, they're not young anymore. But when you go through the contested possession winners, Took Miller, 21. We've talked about him a lot. Yep. Noah Anderson, we're going to start talking about. 15 contested possession winners, uh, contested possessions, 10 clearances. That's a day. Jared Witts, 11 contested, 6 clearances. And there's a kid up there we talked about in the preseason. You, you, you'll remember... Uh, us having a chat about Alex Davies, eleven uh, contested possessions, six clearances. Just everyone was just doing their role, and that's without talking about Matt Rowell, who was just okay. He did did a few things. He had, he had a nice game, but it's not Matt Rowell or bust. There's a group of them now uh, starting to move. So they're better with the footy than the Suns, and people giving credit for. But the Blues, the Blues have got one asset, and now we get to look at them without that asset. Not sure whether the Ruckman comes back this week, but no, I assume he does. But they, they haven't got Paddy Cripps. So they come off the bosom of Paddy Cripps and they say, okay, you've got to go and catch and kill your own now. So Walsh, you've got, to, you've got to give better than you gave on the weekend. I know you've had an impact a couple of, you know, last month or so. So you've got to go next level. Hewitt has to, he has to hang tough while Patrick's not there. Kennedy has to go next level. So anyone that goes in that midfield now almost has the, 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 the sighter on them, the, the scope on them. Hey, can you cover the loss of Patrick Cripps for the next three to four weeks? And it, he grabbed very high on that hamstring, Jared. Yeah. He yeah. grabbed right up just under the buttock and it made me think, see, that's not the spot you want to be grabbing. I, I hope it, it, it is, is only a 21-dayer. It wasn't the belly of the hamstring. It was right up high. So I'm, I was, I'm always nervous about that. And the best bit, I think credit to Adam Simpson, from Monday night when he spoke about this, if we do this well – what we're going through now will pay forward, and it paid forward on Saturday. You know my thoughts on Simo, and before I, before the text messages start coming through, he is a former teammate, and he is a mate of mine. But I still think he's in the absolute pointy end of the best coaches in the competition. Who else could win with a team like this? Seriously. Come up against Collingwood, who, who just say, we don't need to change too much. We don't need to change the way we're playing. Let's go forward. Let's rush the ball at them. We'll get through. But but Adam Simpson sets up a framework. He gives these guys hope. He gives them belief. He says, okay, you don't have to be Luke Shuey. You don't have to be Elliot Yo. You just be you. Patrick Nash, you just be you. We'll, we'll, we'll take you as you are. And he gives them unbelievable confidence in their own ability. He makes every person at that football club feel valued. He respects – they've, they've – by all reports, it's been the most fun environment they've had for ages because they've got guys playing who didn't expect to play. They're having a ball. Yeah. And the guys that are on the sidelines, they've got so much energy to see these young kids or these second-time opportunities or third-time opportunity players just have a crack. Just, hey, show us what you got. And then Willie Rioli does a few things, and Josh Kennedy hardly touches the footy, but when he does, they go through the big sticks. And McGovern says, hey, you got to come through me. And... and and all of a sudden, a little bit of belief generates halfway through the second quarter. You're thinking, oh, they're, they're going okay here, halfway through the third. And then all of a sudden, every time they get to Simo with the breaks, he's sooling them up. Hey, we're in this. we got them here. Let's keep this going. Let's do this. Let's do that. And you, you can see at the start of the last three-quarter time break, as he leaves the huddle, he says, get the first goal. You can see it. You'll show it tonight. He says, just get the first one. They kicked the first one in the first minute of the quarter. And you went, oh, th th what a way to leave them. You know, everyone wants the next goal. Everyone, every coach, every player. Yes. But but the way he, he engages with these players, I think he's a ripper. And I have a look at – I have a, I'm a big believer in stability at your football club. So when the message is the same, that's great. And everyone's involved, okay? Simo's had four players on that list play all four rounds of the year. Four players. Those players are McGovern, who's been outstanding, 
Foley, who's just finding his way as a halfback flanker. Shannon Hearn, who's been Shannon. He's not, he's not the same Shannon Hearn. No, no. And he's starting to make a few blues. But he's an experienced campaigner. He's tapping all these young blokes on the head as regularly. He's done more work tapping on the head than he has with the actual footy yep. in the last three weeks. And the other one is Patrick Nash. They're the only four players that have played all four games. So for the up West to 38 C- players used, well, which just is to- an injury-ravaged season <laughs> in my four weeks. Well, it's just to give you an idea of how low a number four is. The next ranked team, so the next Port West team for, for consistency is Fremantle on 14 players. At the top of the tree, Melbourne and Brisbane have had 20 players play all four games. Yep. 20. So he's, he's operating with four. So I just think what they've been able to do is is, is amazing – and at some point in the next few weeks, the names that are going to come back are going to be Yo, Shuey, Sheed, Kelly, uh, Cripps, Oscar Allen. They're going to look so good coming back in on the ins, and now they've got the, this, this benchmark standard. They, can they get on a run of three or four wins in a row and fight back into the competition? Yep. And they'll, they'll, we talk about momentum at footy clubs and things just just – just happening. Things just Sense happen. Of mission. Yeah, all those things. Overcome. Be ready. So they're, they're interesting on a big picture now, though, I think, is the notion of the hand hovering over the rebuild button, which was probably West Coast lot when they were injury hit coming in, never mind COVID. So I think 0405 answers their question. Bang, onto the reset button. Now... Mm. You know, do, do you do you ride the next few weeks and just see? Well, let's see what the reintegration looks like. Well, the next few weeks is Sydney at home, chance. Port Adelaide away, chance. Richmond at home, you know that's three weeks away. We might have a few more players back by then. Fifty fifty, you'd say, if they get three or four, particularly midfielders back, and then it gets a little bit tough. They got the Lions in Melbourne. Okay, that gets seriously tough. Yeah, not a little bit tough, but. <sighs> I think you've just got to you've just got to take your hat off to what we see. The pressure index sits on the Bulldogs now at one and three. Luke Beveridge, what to do? Just rank kicking, which I mean that that's one of the great efforts of self sabotage you've seen in the game. I don't know what that was going to look like, but they gave themselves no chance with the way they kicked the goal. They nearly coughed up last week's game as well on the back of it. So I just posed the question. Why are we holding faith in the Bulldogs? So I am, um, but I'm not. I'm not sure I could stand against the wall and give you the six reasons why. <laughs> this, the simple answer for me is: is the dogs. The dogs aren't the same tough unit that we've seen over the last couple of years. They're not. You know, I know that their their midfield reads like a, a hall of fame sheet. You know, at the dogs. Yeah, Bont and Pelly and McRae and Lee, but they're going to be lauded for a long time with the dogs. Yeah, Hunter has been a very good servant. Bailey Smith's going to be a star if he's not already. Um, but once that ball leaves the clearance, they're, they're not moving the ball like they did last year. They're not defending like they did last year. It's, it's, it's get, you're gettable now. The dogs are gettable. You know, they ended up, I think, with uh, O'Brien on Rewalt last week. I mean, that, that's, I've never seen O'Brien lock away a player like Rewalt before. So they're, they're sort of still finding out. Um, and then you think, what, what's their what's their absolute strength area? Like in comparison to the competition, where do they say, you got to beat us here? In saying all of that, the third quarter for Marcus Pontempelli, and this is a star-driven league. So you just sometimes need your star to say, yeah. not today. Jeremy McGovern says, not today. Right? Marcus Pontempelli has three shots at goals. He kicks one goal, two, and he drops a mark. That was a contested mark, a tough mark to take. But at his size and with his hands, I backed him to mark that ball top of the goal square third quarter. So he had he had four chances to say, not today, and and didn't take them. Kick one goal, two, and drop that mark. Now, that, that's the game. With the, with, and he had a fantastic game. He did. But if they were to, if they were to win that game, it required more from their absolute top liners. And it and it didn't happen. And I'm not having a go at Marcus, but if he had have done that in the third term, I guarantee you they win. That's that's the comp. That's the harsh reality of of AFL footy. And right now they needed a star to win the game that they're probably were going to lose on you know, on on all facets of the game except for accuracy. They were a bit stiff, but that's the small margins we work with. Yeah, I just think that. 
this is a team that should be graduating to top four and really top two. They they haven't presented into the season like that team. Yeah, and that, that's that's a hundred percent correct. They're, they're they're not at their best. It is as simple as that. And when, when you're struggling to kick goals, Jack Rewalt walks back three-quarter time, kicks a torpedo from outside 50. You go, it's just not our day today. Just not our day. Um, just quickly on the Tigers. Yeah, so is this going to be Richmond? Yeah, yeah, I think it will be. So some weeks, yes, some weeks, no. I still don't think their 80%, 90% sort of effort game or to their best game, their 8 of 10, 9 out of 10 game is going to be good enough to beat the very best, but it's going to be fun. I think they took 11 marks inside 50. Eight of them were contested. So that, that, that that's just shows you how hard how hard it is sometimes. Um, but I'm loving watching Shea Bolton. You know, Lynch found some form. He took some big clunks on the weekend. He played with that real anger. I think he kicked three or four. Um, so there's a lot to like about how they play. There really is. Real is doing some things across half back. We're all waiting to see when the Dusty's coming back, really, to hold absolute faith in them. But Richmond fans, that they've been there, they've seen, they've seen success the last five years. Is it unrealistic to expect a small dip and then and then to spike back up? Possibly. But I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I, I find it hard to write them off. Last yeah, week yeah. we talked them down. We did because we got to talk about what we see. But they're fighters. It is hard to just put a line through them, isn't it? Yeah. It, no, it is. I thought they might be capable of a bit more than they've shown so far, but I, I loved watching them on Saturday night. Um, is Shea Bolton, you're right to mention, Marlion Pickett. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed Jack's torpedo. So what do you say to the umpire? I'm going to kick the torpedo. The umpire said, good luck with that. <laughs> he said, good luck. <laughs> is an umpire so allowed good. to say that? Yeah, I reckon that's excellent. <laughs> so the, the one thing that I just will put up, yep. okay, so we talked about Essendon being 18th without the footy, Richmond is 17th. Okay. So that that's... That's not Richmond, really. Yeah. This might be them throughout the year. Is every second week they'll turn in this and go, oh, I love Richmond. Yeah. And the the other week's going to be mm, that's a bit old and a bit. Yeah. Um, it's going to be good to watch every second week, then, isn't it? Yeah. And and which week you get them on is yeah. going to be like if you give them a chance. So I'll say the Bulldogs gave them a chance. They might have been able to put them away kicking accurately early, and they didn't. And then Grit Richmond just grew into the idea and said, no, nah, not, not tonight. You're not getting near us tonight. Bontempelli had to rip their heart out in the third term, Jared. Mm. Simple as that. You, you, when you got them wobbling on the ropes, the Tigers, you got to knock them out. Uh, PFI. So the Sydney Swans. Oh. I'm a bit um, – I don't know about the Sydney Swans now. <laughs> um. <laughs> So they, they got out of jail on Saturday, and credit to them for getting out of jail. North Melbourne, meritorious in the way that they responded. If they were a slightly better team, Sydney don't get that look a couple of times. Once They had them 14 points a couple of times. I think if North are a little bit better, there's no way back for Sydney. But they scrap and claw, and Heaney gets them out of it late. Mm, yeah. So PFI, Swans. PFI, Swans. Yeah. What's this going to... But is what they're doing going to stack up at the pointy end when it really matters? Look, right, right. They're a long way from where they need to be, is, is the simple answer to that. And they got out of jail on the back of, like you said, a little bit of brilliance from Heaney. Justin McInerney, we talked about at the start of the year. Yeah, Keep your excellent. eye on this guy. His last quarter was unbelievable. 14 disposals in a quarter at the end when they, they just desperately needed someone. We're going to see them without Franklin for a little while. That's that's going to be interesting. Everyone keeps telling me that uh, that, that he's he's not the player he was. Well, we're going to have a look at what they look like without without him. So th that's going to be interesting. Um, so last year, the reason they they were so good last year was they were the best ball movement team in the competition. So give them the footy, and they made you bleed. You know that game we saw against Melbourne was it Melbourne the MCG where they just shifted through them and, and it was scored the Richmond game. Richmond it yeah. was sorry the Richmond game we went wow who are these guys. You know, Hickey in great form. He's out for a while. Um, yeah, McCart McCartan. They, they sort of looked a bit vulnerable for the first time on the weekend, and I, I, had, I hadn't really seen that defensively. But their biggest concerns is they've probably lost. They've probably lost an asset. Where are they, where do they get you? The young midfield and not really bashing teams at the moment. They're not really competitive in terms of contested footy and clearance. Their back six are holding up. Their ball movement's gone. They're not, they're not the team of, of 2021 with the footy. 
So they've got to find an asset. I think John Longmire knew this. When he talked last week publicly, he sort of seemed a bit reserved and a bit concerned after the – so two weeks after the Franklin 1,000 goals. So he sort of knew there's still a lot of work to do um, and we were a bit slow. There was a bit of, bit of a two-week delay in foot. So now now they're, I think they'd be concerned about their contested possession profile and the fact that they're not they're not functioning. How many weeks can you not function for? Um, before you lose touch with, you know, top top four, because if you if you're based out of away from the MCG, Jared, you, you got to get yourself some home finals or the ability to miss a week in the you know in the in the pointy end in September. North Melbourne uh, responded to the challenge of the week. I always think so. We frame it what happens externally. It was really what was happening internally in the coach's words last week, and we all took our cue from that. Uh, so they brought the non-negotiables. Todd Goldstein plays. He plays like that four times a year, and when he does, <laughs> he's a figure. Uh, Horn Francis has his most influential game so far. Jack Zebel switches forward and gives them something to kick to. I thought Cherry was excellent. Um, and as I say, if they were slightly better, they win that game. They they had the the shape of the game on their terms at a couple of key moments, and they just weren't quite good enough. And that goal mouth scramble in the last quarter where the ball was stuck on North Melbourne's goal line with ball and everyone's throwing a boot or a hand and it just wouldn't go. I've never seen that in our sport before. <laughs> that's that's the round ball game, the goal mouth scramble. It was extraordinary. It's, I don't know. I, I, I get frustrated. It's Maybe it's because it's my own team, if you like, and you've got to declare that I've got a, clearly you've got a soft spot for where you, where you played, clearly, and you watch them seriously close. Round one. Minute one, Todd Goldstein starts on the bench. And I think, really? You know, this, this, this guy's in our best two or three. Our best two or three. And then, okay, he might have been challenged through the preseason. If you keep telling someone they're no good, they'll be no good. If you keep pumping them up, you've got a chance. And to see him stay strong enough through that first two or three weeks, and I think he's judged hard, harshly at the Kangaroos. I really do. He's, he's a Hall of Fame player at the Kangaroos. Been a superstar ruckman. He was the reason they were in that game. He's, he's been sensational, both forward of centre, and, and I didn't think he could do it forward of centre. But stand under a high ball and he can mark it. I don't like him leading. I don't like him moving at all. Stand in the goal square and catch and kill your own. And to see them get the positioning right. Zeeble, I've been critical of him at halfback. He comes through in the best and fairest. Yeah. So you have to shut your mouth. And played some really good footy. I hate seeing him having to defend. I like seeing him moving. And to be frank, the Kangaroos don't have a lot of players on their list at the moment that are capable of kicking five goals in any given game. So if he's one, play him forward. Not that hard. Turner, a negating small forward, play him there. Don't try and make him a halfback flanker. Um, he's either a tagger on ball or he's negating. He did a really good job on Blakey. That was a great matchup. And I, I, so the pieces were in the right positions. Um, there's a couple that probably a bit scratchy around the edges. Percent of a Largi. Still looks like he's playing a bit of under eighteen footy to me. Like doesn't look like he's he's absolutely there yet. Goes to ground too easy. He had some bad moments on the weekend, which cost you goals. Um, but they were in the game. You know, I I really like, you know, the, the young kid Horn Francis is doing some things that you go, Wow, that's 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 sensational at this early stage. Simpkin does some things. So the kangaroos to me it's not about talent. You can't have a really poor effort base one week and then a, an absolute max the next. Find some consistency. That comes through standards of training. So get that right. You know, embrace the group. Um, they don't have to play like that. I don't think they'll play at that level every week, Jared. It's unrealistic to expect. But operate in the next 10 to 20% below that. Yeah. And bounce around that area. Don't, don't, don't have the bottom fall out of it every three weeks. Paddy Ryder yesterday, is he going to get suspended? Jared, if I could draw you up. The absolute rule, the reason we have this rule and this, this suspension hanging over these players' heads, it's this act. Guy, in the act of kicking, you're going to be late. You t don't, don't give me brace. This is not brace. This is choosing to bump. You knock a player. He didn't knock him out instantly, but he subbed out of the game with concussion. He's, in effect, knocked out. What, what more do you need to see here? Where's the grey area? And if it's not two weeks... What do we? I'll be fuming because we have talked about this every week since they decided to protect the head. So if it's one, what's well, this little whack with a wet lettuce leaf? 
So either either get serious with this or don't. Oh, and I don't care. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of losing this fight. Yes. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going with it, but I'm sick of losing this fight. Brad Scott tells us at the start of the year, if you choose to bump and you hit the head and you're late and you're late, suspension. Don't give me one week because the the the. The stakes are too high here, Jerry. Do you know how many players, and I keep banging on about this, how many players we have got that have serious life-altering issues at 40 years of age? So, Will Day, I mean, of all players, I mean, he, he, this kid just needs to play footy. What damage has that done to him? Because it's not bandaged up, we can't see it. Because it's not broken, we can't see it. But these these concussions and head trauma, it has to be taken seriously and if they give him one week for the absolute no-brainer act that we see, this is the, what you can't do. So, Paddy, Ryder, we love you, right? We love you. But you can't do this, mate. It's two weeks. I'm sorry. We'll give him one and we'll roll on. Oh, yeah, you can't do that. Okay. You're not changing behaviour. We're not because we're still talking about it. And don't start me on Braden Bruce either. Yeah, so that's twice, once in the preseason and the – the elbow, oh. goodness me, that that's just the swinging elbow back into Monday, wasn't it? So he's lived his he's lived the start of his career under Todd Goldstein. He then moves to Melbourne under Max Gorn. So he doesn't get a lot of opportunity. He played twenty games of AFL footy. This is his chance to actually stand up and play some frontline AFL footy and be the reason your team can compete at clearance and stoppage. They've got a great stoppage uh, core group. And he gets himself rubbed out. I mean, you couldn't be more disappointed a player if you tried. If you're, if you're Leon Cameron, who's fighting for his job, fighting for survival, and, and, and you got this guy who you've got to your club on good money, on good lick, and he does this, like you're entitled to say, mate, what are you doing? Yep. Leon would be furious at Braden Proust. Well, th- this – so I would think this bit is interesting. So what – what approach have they asked him to take? So he gets himself suspended in the preseason. Were, were they furious with him then? And he's done it again. It just makes me wonder, we want you to be Shane Mumford. Oh, we'll wear the first one. Mm, and then it happens again. If you don't address the behavior, uh, I think this is what it looks like a month on. Now, maybe they did. To my eye, I'll bet they didn't. Well, if they did and he's still doing it, that's worse. Because your message is not getting through. Yep. So either he's ignoring you or he's just running his own show. It's rather important that they that he plays. Yeah. I mean, the Giants are living this, is they are one and three and lost the semifinal. So they're one and four without Toby Green. Yeah. Has the club actually sat down and gone, gee, we made a mess of that, didn't we? We didn't exercise any damage control. We wore the full six weeks. It knocked us out of one final series and it might actually sabotage us before we start it the might, next campaign. And it might change your coaches. It yeah. might cause enough turmoil internally that he can't he can't operate it, as you keep putting it. He can't operate in front of the ledger. He's always chasing wins now. Yeah, so they're condemned to chasing the season. The Giants. They're they're always going to be nipping to try to get back to eleven eleven, and I suspect twelve ten is their best result. I reckon they knew that coming into the year. Yeah, and at that level, he's gone. So I'm getting hammered on the text message here. I right? as usual, you're way off. Got to protect yourself first. Ryder had stopped, and he was playing. he wasn't stopped. So, so, Gaz, thanks for texting, mate, but that's just ridiculous. He wasn't stopped. He was coming in to bump. He was coming in to tackle for about two steps, and then he decided to bump late. He didn't brace for his own safety. This is different to the previous instances. This is different to Rioli, okay? And, and I didn't like the Rioli one, but I lost on that one again. He didn't brace. He came in, and he was the only one that, that was going to make contact, and he chose to bump. He chose to bump. So... That he didn't hit him in the head, Cam, please. How did he come up with concussion, Cam? Cam, please. If, if you're going to text in, be remotely accurate. So I'm happy to lose every week on this, okay? I am. But but I don't want to hear Brad Scott and co. come out and say we're protecting the head. Either we just put our hand in the air and say, no, nah, we, we, we just can't. We try. We, we like the idea of this, but in, in reality, we can't, we can't bring it in. We're always looking for ways to get players off. That's our starting point. Oh, how can we get him off here? Did he brace? Did he brace? Yeah, he braced. Hang on, he braced. Guys, he braced. Let's just give him, let's let him off. He braced. No, no. The brace and the bump are two drastically different things. He didn't change his mind the last second. He bumped. And he got a player who, 
Unfortunately for Paddy, he was he's six inches smaller. He flushes him in the head. All right. So the MRO is one thing, uh, and then the the umpire, and then the rules are another. So you've got this as the debate, Kingy, yeah. and you just simply pose the question: What are the rules? <laughs> well, so, okay. So everyone's talking about the Hawkins push in the back on Harris Andrews. Okay. It's it's bigger than just one goal and one moment in the game. So okay, everyone say, oh, but it wouldn't have decided the game. That's fine. For, just just forget that for a moment. It is a significant moment for the AFL to come out and tell us what the rules actually are, because most teams, including the Brisbane Lions, who are going to be there at the pointy end of the season, play an assertive defence. So your key defenders start, you know, three, four, five metres in front of their direct opponent, guard the leading lane, guard the dangerous space with the protection that if they roll back that they won't be able to be pushed in the back and moved out of the way. So that's the whole reason that they start. In it. So they get first look at the footy, the ability to intercept, mark or diffuse. If that is no longer a viable starting point, if you can be shifted like Harris Andrews was, then you need to tell every team this. You need to tell every coach that, that there's been a shift. You actually are allowed to push people in the back and move them. There's no way Harris Andrews stands there if he knows he's able to be moved like that. So tell the clubs that this decision, not only was it wrong, that any time we see hands in the back like that and, and momentum started from that position, not holding your ground or anything like that, I understand the difference. Because teams, teams are using significant strategy around this. So the pressure at the source to force the hat kick forward, assertive defence, intercept, away we go. If that's not the model anymore, tell us, because it's a, it's a significant change. Yep. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. So we would work as a starting point. So this is the what they got wrong, because the explanation simply doesn't match what happened. So if this is a one-off mistake, I'm fine with that. Yeah, and it is. It is? Well, it has to be. Well, do you know that, though? Do you know it's that? Not a, I'd say it's not a one-off mistake. So let me give you that laptop, right? So just push play there. This is Harris Andrews three minutes later. Yeah, well, this Harris... is the funniest moment of the yeah, night. No, I saw this Ball moment. comes in yeah. and Harris Andrews, two hands in the back, pushes his opponent underneath, takes the mark yeah. and dares the umpire to blow the whistle and there's no whistle blown. No, what he's saying <laughs> is, what so he, yeah, what he's saying is, oh, well, if the rules are changed, right. I'm playing I'm this way as well. pushing this bloke square in the back. But, I, I love Harris Andrews for it, incidentally. So if you, if you go back and look through the course of that game, Okay, and this is why I wish I was on first crack last night. So Tom Hawkins nudges Marcus Adams in the back twice earlier in the game. One, he takes a mark. And Marcus Adams said, come on, I'm in front. And then he's pushed me. So it's ha it happened a fair bit through the course of the night. So this is not a once-off in this game. And it's happened across the course of the weekend. We saw it. You see it everywhere. And once you start seeing it, you can't stop seeing it. So tell us what the rules are. The second part of tell us what the rules are is – the 50 metre penalty. So the dogs don't want to man the mark. They, they want to go back that five metres and be out of that little um, stand zone and be part of an 18 man defence. They feel that if the guy standing in the mark is, is effectively not engaged defensively, that they play with a 17 man defence. So the rules say you've got two to three seconds to roll back out of that zone. Now on the weekend, they had 50 metre penalties paid against them for rolling back once the umpire's yelled stand. Now, the, the umpire's yelling it too quickly uh, before the player has a chance to get out um, and then paying the 50, or the players have got it totally wrong. Now, I don't think the players have got it totally wrong because they've been practising this for months because this is done by design. So how long have you got? If it's two to three seconds, then the umpires have to all be on the same page with this. You can't have – this is not an interpretation – it's not. So if there's been a shift in this, tell us. Because the dogs got stiffed by a couple on the weekend. So again, I just think I just think that we have to have consistency across the game so that we can embrace strategy. Otherwise, we're all going to play the same way. Take the confusion out of it. It needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed quickly so the Brisbane Lions know what they're doing and the dogs can continue on with their defensive strategies. Yeah. So the dogs are duty-bound to ring and find out this week, aren't they? No, the AFL have to tell everyone. It's yeah. not just the dogs. Yeah. Because every team will do this. Do you think the dog's strategy is working? The philosophy? 
No, I don't. But but again, they're trying something and they're four weeks in. Yeah. So maybe at round 10 it will work. So we're early to jump on that. But I just think we, we have to know what the rule is. So if they want to roll back, let them roll back. But don't pin them halfway through their – they're only got to go five metres. Like, I think the umpires are too quick to pay. They, they want to get involved in this stand rule. Oh, that's he, he's moving, he's moving, he's moving an eighth of an inch out of the way. But that is um, – the, the defence I'll give the umpires that, that is the job, is but, if you are not standing, it's a 50-metre penalty. Yeah. So once he says stand, you lose your rights to go back. Now, has he yelled stand too quickly? That's, that's relevant, but not – it's Once he says stand, bad luck to you. But it's more than relevant. Yeah. Because you've you've been in a marking contest. Yeah, but if you move an eighth of an inch once he's told you to stand, that's it. That, that's yeah. actually what we're asking the umpires to do. Agree. There's no grey in there. Agree. But if he's if he's just if his opponent's just taken the mark and he's now tracking backwards to be part of an eighteen man defence, because the rules say you've got three seconds to do that, don't rob him of that. And then not only rob him of that, like say stand again if you have to, but don't pay fifty metres. Because you're giving a goal. It's a huge penalty for the umpire not allowing the correct amount of time. This is the discussion. So you make you, you compound one error into two. What do you want to do with the seedings, David King? Well, there's a few paganisms coming through yes. on, the, uh, on the text. So I'm going to use a paganism. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to piss down their back and tell them it's raining, right. Jude. I'm right. going to be honest about the seedings. Yep. At one, I've got Melbourne. There is no two. There is no three. <laughs> At four, I've got Brisbane. And I know they got beaten on the weekend, but I think it was a solid performance at the Cattery where most teams go and fail. And at home, I think they'll be more than bulletproof. You... That's not going to translate on Twitter. I know. Just so you know, that's not going <laughs> to translate on Twitter. Nothing translates on Twitter, Jerry. All right. So you've got one gap, gap, Brisbane. So yep. my, my seating's had a rough week. The Blues and the Dogs, so yeah. they're both out. Both out. Yeah. You can't. You're in the seedings. Ruthless. We trust you. Ruthless. You turn in those performances. Out. <laughs> Four, St Kilda. Saints. I think if you run, if I run those three weeks together, yep. that's good enough to be in the best four in the competition right now. Uh, and let's see if that three gives way to the next three and they really harness something. Three, Geelong, sort of had them in and out and in and out. You haven't loved them, have you? No, no, but I, they... I thought they were the better team on Friday night, but for the same circumstances you've articulated, I'm keeping Brisbane at two. Yep. McInerney was a huge loss for them. Uh, they hung tough right through. You flip that game to the Gabba. What does it look like? So that felt to me like two high-quality teams with a role to play at the pointy end. But I'm just going to leave them at two and three as a result. Can I leave you with a poser? And Melbourne's at one. Can I leave you with a poser? Yep. Which coach has the greatest headaches this week? Is it, is it Ken Hinckley? Is it is it Matthew Nix? Is it Adam Simpson? Is it Leon Cameron? They is could, it yeah? Is it Luke Beveridge? Is it John Longmire? Who has the greatest headaches? To be continued, the Monday Means Test Round Four with David King. <laughs>